Hey guys, welcome to Collider Movie Talk, movie talk for movie fans. I'm your host, Ashley Mova, and this is The Daily Show. We give you all the latest news from the world of movies, plus some insight into what it all means. Leading off the show today is John Campia. Well, greetings and salutations, everybody. Welcome to the best damn movie-related show on the planet Earth, coming to you from right here at the Collider Video Studios here in Burbank, California, and we are so glad you decided to make us part of your day. Also here is John Schnepp. I feel younger, I feel so young, <laughs> hey. It's... John Schnepp's birthday Yay! today, ladies and gentlemen. Happy birthday, Running towards the grave. I'm running. Oh, okay, hang on a second. <laughs> Happy birthday, Schnepp. Also here, Perry Nemiroff. Happy birthday, Schnepp. And how's my mic? Do we need any more adjusting from anybody? I think we just need <laughs> just a few oh, okay. more. <laughs> is it working? Also okay. here is Mark Ellis. Happy birthday. <laughs> we got to pay. Stop it. Stop it. Stop it. Stop it. Stop it. We're going to get copyright trouble. What? Really? Yeah. No, that's uh, over. Is that ending it's, now? Now you can do it. They're really? Co- yeah, it like, ended, like, like you can actually sing you can Happy sing Birthday it, now? And that, no, wow. There's no lawsuit anymore. You I don't think the birthday song people would want to flag what I just did. I think you're <laughs> lying and you just want us to sing Happy <laughs> Birthday. I absolutely, I'm not lying. You <laughs> can Google it right now. No, it's true. All right, hey, listen, guys. We got a bunch of cool-looking <laughs> things here in the sidebar, but a couple of things that had not dropped <laughs> when the sidebar had been created have dropped, starting off with a little trailer about apes. Ashley, tell us about it. 20th Century Fox has released the final War for the Planet of the Apes trailer online. Director Matt Reeves returns for the follow-up, which picks up a few years after the events of Dawn of the Planet of the Apes, where an all-out war between the humans and the apes is underway. Caesar, played by Andy Serkis, sets out to exact vengeance against the Colonel, played by Woody Harrelson, who has amassed a massive human army at a compound deep in the snow. The film also stars Steve Zahn and Judy Greer and opens in theaters on July 14th. Uh, Judy Greer, uh, for just uh, John Roke is watching. Just mark that on your oh, notes there. Judy Greer. Oh, shot fire. Um, great trailer. Great trailer. And if this is indeed the last trailer, it's a great one to send us into the movie with. It showed every aspect of what makes these series of eight movies great. You got, of course, you got some heart-pounding action, but you got the dramatic elements of the apes really coming into their own. Now we finally get to see the human resistance, I guess you can call them rising up at this point. This looks awesome. Although, in the midst of all the awesomeness, there is one thing I found a little bit distracting, just just a bit. There's this, I I don't know if it's a new ape, I don't remember seeing this ape before, Uh, a lot less hair than the other ones, talking about bad humans, and like all I could see was Dobby. Mm. Like, just in the way he looked and Dumb. talked, all I saw was Dobby the monkey. That's all I saw. Wow. I, I, and, but other than that, this trailer's fantastic. I loved it. I cannot wait for this movie. Uh, John, this trailer did what I hoped a war for the Planet of the Apes trailer would do, is that it proved you can be strong and thoughtful, intelligent, and still have no desire to wear pants whatsoever. <laughs> I am so on Team Ape here, but I'm on the team of this movie more so because this trailer showed us so much without spoiling anything. Like, it's hard to do that over three trailers to show us all this cool action and set up what the story is without giving us too much. And I was having to be like, oh, okay, easy, guys. I don't want to see this anymore. I'm ready to get into the movie. I think Woody Harrelson looks like a menacing villain, the best kind, your favorite kind of villains, because he thinks he's doing the right thing. I'm a human. I'm rooting for the apes. Looks magnificent to me. Perry. I love this. And I love the fact that it feels like a final trailer, too. Because the cool thing about this, if you go back and you watch all the trailers, it does add a little more every single time you watch a new one. But we still don't really know much about the story. When you watch these trailers, the story I come up with is apes versus humans. And that's pretty much it at this point, which is all I really want to know before I actually see the final movie. This thing looks beautiful too. I don't know why I'm so surprised every time I watch a new piece of promo material from this movie, but I mean, the design of the apes and just the shot design overall, I mean, still when I see those the, the green lasers going through the darkness, everything is kind of just blowing my mind. I'm really, I mean, every single apes movie has looked beautiful, but yeah. I'm kind of bowled over by the visuals I've seen so far in this one. Schnepp. Yeah, this looks like a really well put together film. I think this is my favorite trailer of all of them. Though I did kind of like the I, maybe the second to last one where it was like Woody Harrelson like shaving oh, yeah. or whatever, putting on the weird war paint and stuff. Because it was definitely setting it up apes versus humans. But with this trailer, we did we got the weird skinnish like weird Dobby <laughs> ape. But we also had a little bit more of the human character that the apes yeah. are kind of adopting or or taking with them. So they're X twenty three. Yeah, it's like or Nova or whoever it's gonna whoever that's gonna end up being. It's like. Like, I think it's great. I want to see more. I hope this isn't the last 
Apes movie because every single addition to this franchise is exciting and fun. So I'm looking forward to it. I don't want to get ahead of ourselves because we have all seen amazing trailers to bad movies. Sure. So I don't want to get ahead of ourselves. But if this movie holds serve and is as good, let's not even we won't let's not even say better than, but let's just say as good as the previous two. We are now talking about a Apes trilogy that has to come into the conversation when you're going to start talking about some of the greatest trilogies ever made. Sure. It's got to at least be a part of the conversation. I'm not saying it usurps, you know, Star Wars or Lord of the Rings or Godfather. I'm, I'm not necessarily saying that, but I'm saying it comes into the conversation. One of the things that is so special about it is that if you look at the first one with James Franco and then you move into the second one and now into the third, these are three completely different chapters. Like that first Apes movie was a totally different movie than the second one. And it looks like this third one is bringing completely new stuff to the table as well. This is going to be one of the really special trilogies of all time if it turns out being as good as we kind of hope it, it does. It looks like it's going to usurp Dunstan Checks In as the best ape movie we've had <laughs> in a long time. You know, John, when I was watching this, my, my face smiled, and then there were two hearts where my eyes were, a lot like the popular <laughs> emoji. Which is a fantastic transition. <laughs> oh. Well done, Mark Ellis. What I'm here for. There's another trailer dropped uh, this morning. And I'll use that word dropped in, <laughs> in you know, metaphorical and literal ways. Uh, for the Emoji Movie. Now look, going into the Lego Movie, let's rewind a little bit. I said, Lego Movie looks stupid. How do you do an entire movie based on, like, play blocks? And the movie ended up being terrific. I mean, just fantastic. We have been saying about the Emoji Movie, this looks like bottom of the barrel. Uh, this looks terrible but then the trailer drops and affirms all of our fears this looks terrible absolutely terrible and again we have all seen terrible trailers that ended up being great movies and maybe that'll be the case with emoji i'm not saying that the movie is going to be bad we won't know until we see it my feeling is that it's going to be bad i mean this i think this trailer is rubbish i didn't even grin once i did not grin once watching that trailer i know schnepp you saw it do you have a, a counter argument? Are you going to yeah. fight me on this? No, here's my emoji. <laughs> <laughs> That's a, fucking garbage. I mean, you know what? It's, it's a sad thing because it's like, yeah, you withhold. You're like, look, it sounds like a really stupid idea. But yeah, Lego proved me wrong. I'm like, I'll, I'll wait. I'll rip on it until I see a trailer. And then hopefully the trailer is really good. This trailer is like combining Tron and Wreck-It Ralph, but all the worst parts of it. Yeah. It's just not funny. Everything just felt stale and old and already out of date. I mean, I don't want to see Candy Crush jokes. It's just, just everything about it sucked. And then I was like, oh, thank God I haven't seen Patrick Stewart yet. And then, of course, they saved the poop till the end. It was just like, <laughs> poop. <laughs> Perry, what did you think? Ah, uh, three for three no, down. I, I don't like it. And for, for just a little quick second when we were watching the very beginning of it and the idea was, oh, emojis only can be one emotion and it's this emoji struggling with that. For just like the quickest second, I'm like, oh, they might have something there. And then they took that five seconds further into the trailer. I'm like, no, this is stupid. It, it does not deserve a full feature. And the, the damn poop joke. I saw it coming from the second the trailer oh, yeah, started. And right, then it yeah. came and it wasn't funny. That is not what she said. <laughs> <laughs> Mark, right. are you going to salvage this one? I'm going to attempt. A re this is a real emoji. You can find your phone right now. <clears throat> <laughs> <laughs> I uh, I didn't hate it as much as you guys did. I, I, I giggled a fair amount. I don't think the movie looks good, but it looks very cookie cutter, very formulaic. Like, I got a Monsters Inc. vibe off this, where Ooh. it's the inner workings of something that is that, that clearly us humans don't understand but can appreciate from a storyline. So this is going to be successful. It, that is is the vibe I get from this trailer. I think kids are going to eat this up because kids. I'm not going to go to this movie and say, oh, they're stealing from Wreck-It Ralph. They're stealing from Inside Out. They're just going to go and enjoy seeing these emojis. This has an, an angry bird ceiling to it. So they mined a story out of it. I like some of the vocal talent. I don't think this movie is going to be a good film. I giggled a couple times watching it. I like seeing Stephen Wright's voice show up as T.J. Miller's Wright. dad. That made me laugh. I don't think it's going to be a good flick, though. 
All right, let's move on to the first official story of the day. <laughs> Writer-director Joss Whedon's Batgirl could be the next DC female superhero movie to hit theaters following director Patty Jenkins' Wonder Woman. This according to Deborah Snyder, co-founder of Cruel and Unusual Films and the producer of the DCEU movies. In a series of tweets from people in attendance at the Wonder Woman Chinese premiere red carpet event, Deborah Snyder said Whedon's Batgirl will reach theaters before a potential Wonder Woman sequel. While 2018 seems to be a bit of a stretch depending on the script at the stage, it could suggest that 2019 is a real possibility for when Batgirl could hit theaters. John, thoughts on a potential Batgirl movie being the next female-led DCU movie? Well, let's put some asterisks beside this. This is coming... This isn't coming from the most solid of reliable sources. It's just coming from, from some people who were there and who are saying that Deborah Snyder said this at the premiere. So let's just go with that for a minute. Well, like we are certainly not confirming to you that this is the case, but if it is, let's discuss it for a second. What is most interesting to me about if this is true is that it means that Batgirl, which got announced long after Gotham City Sirens, would be coming before Gotham City Sirens. Because if Deborah, if what she's saying is that you know, it's going to be the next female-centric film. Well, if assuming that Gotham City Sirens, with everything we've heard, is also a female-centric film, it is interesting that it came up out of nowhere and kind of usurped that spot away from Gotham City Sirens. Now, does that mean there's anything necessarily wrong going on with Gotham City Sirens and things are falling apart behind the scenes? No, 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 not necessarily. It just might mean that they saw the background movie and thought, this makes more sense to us to have this come in first, before this one. Because maybe they want to incorporate the Batgirl character into Gotham City Sirens. I mean, maybe that's the case, and it just makes sense. I would be all for it. Look, I I'm dying to see Joss Whedon take a stab at this character. We know he's loved this character for a long time. I hope it's not identical to another incarnation of Batgirl. I like, I've liked a lot of incarnations of Batgirl, but I want to see Josh Whedon's version of it and see what he does with it. And if it's up next and it comes as early as 2019, all the more power to it. Schnapp, what do you think? Well, Josh Whedon, you know, I mean, he's an incredible writer. He did an incredible job with the Avengers films. I, I don't want to see a Batgirl movie before I see a Batman film. I just feel like they should establish the Batman in the DC Cinematic Universe better than they did with Batman v Superman. He's, you know, it was a co-starring role or whatever. I want to see the Batman and, and what they're going to do with his world before we see all the ancillary characters like We still Nightwing. could, though. I mean, she's not saying this will definitely come before a Batman film. Now, this question is, could we see a Batman film as early as 2019? I agree. I mean, I, you're... Look, they did everything backwards, so they started with Suicide Squad introducing the Joker and Harley Quinn before you had a Batman. So... I mean, I think Gotham City Sirens, I would rather see that first before Batgirl and introduce Batgirl in that, similarly mm. like, to the way they did Batman v Superman, introducing Batman into the Superman world. Um, that's how I'd rather see it, but who knows? Mark. DC's whole kind of slate feels like when you're at the doctor's office and you're filling out a bunch of forms and you just start, like, you put in your zip code before you write your name and then you put in, like, the, <laughs> the phone number and your social security before you put the address. Like, this is not the standard order that you would think they would release movies. And that goes all the way back to when they had Man of Steel and then the sequel to Man of Steel was Batman v Superman, which turned out to be something completely different. So they never really had a set plan, and this echoes that. Now, I'd be all up for seeing Batgirl come out as soon as possible. I'm not as excited about it as you are to see Joss Whedon's interpretation. I would have liked to have find somebody else, but I understand why they want to go with the name power of Joss Whedon. That's probably one of the things that is getting Batgirl pushed through. I think also the name power of Batgirl is going to get this more popularity in the inner workings of DC than something like Gotham City Sirens. If you have a Batgirl movie, so you have all the positive stuff going with the Batman character right now, and you also have Joss Whedon's name attached to it versus Gotham City Sirens, which has the Suicide Squad stink attached to it, you would want to put Batgirl out as early as possible. Now, whether it's going to be before or after Batman remains to be seen, but I would like to see Batgirl get out because I think it's a it's it's going to be a more fun... I just think it sounds like a better movie than what we're going to get with Gotham, uh, Gotham City Sirens. That's a tongue twister. <laughs> Gotham City Sirens. <laughs> Perry. I really want to see this Batgirl movie. I'm very excited for Joss Whedon. I think this is a great idea. I... Whether or not this quote was, you know, transcribed or recorded accurately on this red carpet, because I don't think there's a whole bunch of sources to back it up, and I don't, I don't know if we've ever experienced something directly with this particular source. Even if it's true, I, I don't believe it. Everything has moved around so much. We're talking about the next female-led superhero movie before Wonder Woman even comes out, and I don't want to say that the success of Wonder Woman will dictate the future of Batgirl, but... 
it, it really can have an effect. So who knows what's going to happen with Wonder Woman? Who knows what's going to happen with Justice League? And really, they're talking about so many movies at this point that do not have concrete release dates set. Right. So even though I like the idea of getting a Batgirl movie in 2019, I, I'll believe it. I, I'm, I'll believe it a little bit when it has an official date that came from a press release that came from Warner Brothers. But until then... I feel like I'm I'm on you know choppy waters, rocky whatever. I I just don't believe any of this really. Well, look, let, let's keep this in mind too. Look, I I think Wonder Woman is going to exceed expectations, and I think it's going to make a minimum eighty million dollars opening weekend. I think it's also I've said this before. I will say it again. It'll be the first DCEU movie that cracks seventy five percent on Rotten Tomatoes or higher. Mm. I believe those two things. Now put that on the shelf for a second. If Wonder Woman opens to $30 million, it's not, but if it did, <laughs> right. uh, Warner Brothers has shown with their DC properties, they are very reactionary. They are very reactionary. I think that's fair to say. I think even the most staunch of, of Warner Brothers and DC supporters will say that they are reactionary. Sometimes that's not good, but sometimes it's good too. If that were to happen, I guarantee you Batgirl gets pushed. Or, or at least put on hiatus or whatever. I do think it would affect it a great deal. I think if Warner Brothers put out a, a Warner Brother puts out Wonder Woman and it gets like a thirty-five million dollar opening, you know, thirty percent Rotten Tomato ma meter again, all that kind of stuff. I believe you will hear within four weeks of massive changes to their lineup. I don't think that's what's going to happen. I think Wonder Woman is going to be an incredible success. Uh, but, but you know, if that were the case, I do think it affects it. It's just frustrating if you're a DC fan right now because you're waiting for all these characters to get to the big screen in a way that you've been dreaming about seeing them your whole lives. Hopefully Wonder Woman can do that, but they can't even get their, their flagship character Batman into a movie in, in t like with all these changes happening with Batman. It's like, if that guy can't get it in shape, yeah. how is anybody else going to be able to have any sort of you know, concrete timeline where we know when the movie's coming out. So it's just a frustrating thing right now if you love these DC characters like we do. Well, right now, the 2018 only has one film coming out. It's Aquaman. I mean, because The Flash got pushed back. Batman's gotten pushed back. So I honestly think Gotham City Sirens will be the first female-led film to come out. Why? Because Suicide Squad made so much money, and Margot Robbie as Harley Quinn is a an incredible character and lots of people want to see continuing adventures with her she's already established that's money in the bank all right what's next according to deadline blake lively has signed on to start in bruised a mixed martial arts action drama directed by the notebook and my sister's keeper helmer nick cassavetes lively will play jackie a single mother working two jobs and a disgraced mma fighter who has been up against the ropes her entire life when the authorities threaten to take away her young son from her, she must get back in the cage for one last chance to fight for redemption and give her son the life she's always wanted. The deal is being finalized at the Cannes Film Festival with a September start of production being planned. Perry, thoughts on Blake Lively starring in the MMA movie Bruised? I love this idea. I'm not, I don't watch, I know some of you guys are fans of MMA and my thing with it is whenever it's on, I will leave it on and I will become engrossed and obsessed with it. And then I'll turn it off and I'll forget about it until it happens to come on my TV again. <laughs> I just love the idea of bringing MMA, boxing, all those sorts of sports to screen. Because one of, one of my favorite recent boxing movies that got completely brushed aside was that movie, uh, I think it was called Bleed for This with Edgar yeah. Ramirez. Right. That deserved more credit than it got and i really just and all, i mean also when you want to talk about creed i just love the way that you could shoot scenes like that because creed in particular had some of the best fight sequences i've ever maybe ever seen in my life in terms of that sport but i think this movie has lots of potential and i think blake lively deserves a shot to lead something like this i mean she's obviously proved that she has some box office clout with the shallows you like you like my shark plug she's gonna fight the shark in this movie <laughs> <laughs> exactly there you go but really, she deserves something like this. I kind of want to see her, her push herself, you know, both in terms of dramatic acting and also something like this would pose a serious challenge for her physically also. And with Cassavetes, it's a, it's a nice switch to a degree. I mean, obviously, he's particularly famous for The Notebook, but I really loved Alpha Dog, and this seems like it could be a good combination of, you know, real intensity and heart to it, too. So I think this is a great package. This is terrific news. I think Blake Lively is one of those actresses who is better than the movies she's been in would represent. Because you even take a mediocre at best movie like Savages. 
I thought she was terrific in that movie. I mm. thought she put on a hell of a performance in that movie in some very challenging kinds of scenes and very challenging kinds of dialogue. And I think she acquits herself very well. When I hear about this, I go back to Warrior. Warrior was so damn good. Mm. So damn good. And so I think they're, the world is now, I'm, I am biased because I'm a huge mixed martial arts fan, right? So obviously I have, I'm predisposed to want to see an MMA movie. But when you get talent like this, with a director like this, I love the idea. That it's a classic underdog kind of story. It's a redemption kind of story set into the world of MMA. It's, there's not much here for me to not be excited about. Schnapp, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm not a watch MMA. I know a lot of I've got a lot of friends like Josh Barnett who who actually beat the hell out of dudes in a ring. So it's <laughs> like you know what I mean. It's like and you guys watch it, so sometimes I'll see you guys watching it and whatnot. But um, for myself, this kind of <clears throat> this kind of storyline echoes like the wrestler, like the Mickey Rourke film. It definitely it has that kind of like where you like have a person who's put up against the ropes, so to speak, in real life, and they have to go back into something that they kind of maybe left or were disgraced for doing, and they have to do it again it's a comeback chance so i think it's kind of cool to see blake lively do it you know i i'm it, it just because i've seen it male the male version i'm looking forward to seeing the female version isn't it great that this deal was finalized at can film festival too like they're just sitting around <laughs> eating cheese drinking wine talking about beating the crap out of people in a ring i love this idea i'm not a big mixed martial arts fan because when you have to do it on the mean streets to fight crime you tend not to want to watch it at home <laughs> now having that out of the way i enjoy sports movies i love a good sports movie it doesn't matter what the sport is like something like warrior really affected me emotionally boxing movies i'm a huge fan this sounds a lot like southpaw mm. where you have to get back in the ring to fight for not just your legacy in sport but also to help keep your family together so it's clearly going to have that emotional tinge to it. and you're right blake lively i thought she was very impressive in the shallows in the town she did what she could in green lantern so i don't fault her for the movies she's been in that haven't been great but i think she's got a lot of potential so i'm on board it's got a real flavor of Cinderella Man to it as well, like the way you were describing right. that. Like you got to come, you, you're fighting for more than yourself. You're fighting for your family as well, and I like those types of tastes. Let me ask you a question: If if she hadn't lost and she was still like this undefeated, like greatest in their sport of all time, do you think Ronda Rousey is up for this role? Uh, I think she would erroneously be in the conversation from mm -hmm. for it, uh, and I'm a big Ronda Rousey fan. Even though like she should retire, by the way, she should absolutely retire. She's done. <laughs> But even though I'm a big fan of what she did for the sport, she did more for women in sport than I think any female athlete ever has. That being said, she's not an actress, and she can't act. She should never have been up for any role in any movie ever. And if she was still riding high in all this popularity, I would hope that a director like, like Nick would say no. I am not putting. I'm not putting this non. Dude, Ronda Rousey in this was good in Fate, like whatever that stupid Furious movie was. Entourage, jumping too. around, yeah, yeah she's jumping around, fighting people. I would, I would take, I would take the Williams sisters as the more important figures <laughs> in female sport. But no, I, I think it's up for debate because Ronda Rousey was huge for her. She transcended her own sport. All right. Well, listen, there are a few movies opening up in theaters this weekend. Only really one worth talking about. Which one is that? It's Alien Covenant. Bound for a remote planet on the far side of the galaxy, members Catherine Waterson and Billy Crudup of the colony ship Covenant discover what they think to be an uncharted paradise. The While there, they meet David Michael Fassbender, the synthetic survivor of the Doom Prometheus expedition. The mysterious world soon turns dark and dangerous when a hostile alien life form forces the crew into a deadly fight for survival. Uh, look, uh, if you want to see my full review, it's up on our Collider YouTube channel right now. Just go into under reviews and you'll find it there. But, you know, spoiler, I love this movie. Mm -hmm. I really, really enjoyed this movie, which is so refreshing because I was one of those people who was really let down by Prometheus. I did not find, I love what Prometheus was trying to do. I love the mythology they were trying to set up. But everything that, to me, as an audience member, that Prometheus failed at, I felt like Alien Covenant picked up on and then completed properly. And then mixed the feeling of the first Alien with the second film, Aliens, and gave you the best of both worlds to me. I'm not saying it's the best of the franchise. Aliens, to me, still has that crown and probably always will. But this was, if you were a fan of Aliens, you're going to go into this movie, you're going to enjoy it for what Prometheus was trying to do, and you're going to enjoy it for what Aliens did. 
I, I really got a big kick out of this film. It's something I think you got to rush out and see. This is what I want to hear. I was in Nashville when you all saw it, so uh, I didn't get a chance to. But, like, look, I've been to a lot of outer space expeditions, okay? When you come across <laughs> an alien, if it opens its mouth and nothing comes out, you're good. You're good to go. You can defeat that alien. <laughs> but if it opens its mouth and then another mouth comes out, get the hell out of there because that thing's a badass. This trailer has got me so pumped to see it because of what you just said. I want to see a mix of the horror of Alien and the action sci-fi of Aliens. That's what this looks like to me. I'm hearing mostly positive positive things. So this is a Thursday night. As soon as you and I are done with our other obligation on Thursday night, mm -hmm. I'm heading over here and I'm seeing Alien Covenant. I'm getting a big bucket of corn. What about you, Perry? That sounded really shady. Um, what? Your, other <laughs> oh, your other obligation on Thursday night. We, uh, we're, we're men about town. <laughs> There you go. Um, <laughs> the way you just described it is exactly what I liked about the movie. So to me, Covenant was a mix between Alien and Aliens, which I loved, and then Prometheus, which I think it worked. Some of that worked better. I like what they do with some of the ideas that they bring, bring about in Prometheus. But that was the weaker part of the movie for me, where I love action and horror and some of the other stuff. It, you know, it's not that it completely fell flat and was stupid or anything. It just, one part of this movie was very, very strong to me, and the other one was like, okay. But yeah, mm. over overall, I really liked it. I highly recommend it, and because I think it's worth repeating, don't watch any more promos before you see it. <laughs> Schnapp, I absolutely love this film. I mean, I, I also really liked Prometheus. I love the first two, Alien and Aliens. This is a great synthesis of all three of those films, and it does some stuff that it's, you know, look, Ridley Scott, is, do, is not playing the same game. He's not making mm. just a you know, remake of Alien or even a remake of Aliens. He's trying different stuff. He's bringing in some of those ideas from Prometheus into the Alien world. I think it's done quite successfully. I love all of the ideas that they like hybridized into Prometheus Aliens. It's a really fun film. There's a few things that make it like I gave it 8.5. You can see my review on Schneb Zone. Uh, it's like I, I personally, I can't wait to see it again. I want to see it with a giant crowd, a crowd screaming and freaking out because this is a real horror film. That's another thing that it's not just an action film. It is a horror action film. So I really cannot impress enough upon you. Don't listen to the haters. Go see Alien Covenant. Yeah, you know what? And uh, Eastbound and Down guy. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Danny McBride. Dan right. Oh, good He's North guy. Carolina kid. <laughs> Look, I, I thought, oh, well, this is a mistake when they put him in there just because just yeah. his very presence totally. was going to take you out of it. He's good in the movie. He's really good. Yeah. He's one of the best. I, I yeah. really like him in the movie, so there you go. All right, folks, we reached out part of the show now for buy or sell. Here's how this works. In front of her, Ashley has a few other items in the world of movie news. She's going to run them down. Then those of us at the table are simply going to say whether we buy it or sell it. So, Ashley, what do we got? The big push for Wonder Woman is just beginning, but now it seems Warner Brothers is already developing a follow-up to their first female-led superhero film. In a report via Slash Film, Arthur Wong was in attendance at the Shanghai press event for Wonder Woman when Zack Snyder revealed on the red carpet that WB and DC Films are already planning a sequel. There's no word yet on when Wonder Woman 2 could make its way to theaters, but fans should get a better idea when the first movie hits theaters on June 2nd in just under three weeks' time. Schnett Byersell D DC and Warner Brothers planning Wonder Woman 2. I buy it. I'm very excited to see that they have the faith in Wonder Woman, the first film, before it comes out, that they're talking about setting up a second film. But we hear that all the time. Yes, we do. So that's not, it's nothing new, even for them to pre-announce it before the film comes out. We're planning on making Wonder Woman 2. They can plan and say, we've got a trilogy. We've got seven Wonder Womans. We're going we're gonna to make all of these movies. It depends on how much the movie makes box office wise internationally I'm, I'm with you john i think it's going to be a big hit i was very excited to hear early word from some of the screenings that it's a really fun film it's a solid film so look i, I really hope that it's a great it's a, it's knocks it out of the park for dc not just financially but critically i can't wait to see the film you know one of the criticisms i've had of of warner brothers when it comes to their dc properties too has always been one they're they're reactionary we've talked about that but the other has been they've they've usually lacked showing confidence in their property. And I think this is the right thing for Warner Brothers to do. Even if Warner Brothers thinks that Wonder Woman is terrible, the right thing to do is to get out and show confidence in your movie and say, you know what, we're already talking about number two. We got the plans and the works for number two. And that is the right thing to do. And as somebody who wants them to succeed, it's really refreshing for me to see Warner Brothers plant their flag and say, we believe in this and we're talking about this. Now, again, it goes back to what we were talking about Batgirl. 
all the best laid plans of mice and men. They they were planning seven Power Rangers movies. We were going to get Aragon two. We were going to get all these. This is great to talk about it, but again, if Wonder Woman opens the thirty million dollars, we ain't going to see Wonder Woman yeah. two at that point. But again, I think this movie is going to be a big hit. I think it's going to be critically acclaimed. I think it's going to make a good amount of money, and I think we are going to see Wonder Woman two. And I'm just glad that they're getting out ahead of it and showing some confidence. Perry. You had to go there, didn't you? You had <laughs> to go there. Japan Power Rangers. has not spoken yet. Japan, <laughs> we're right on you for more Thanks Power Rangers. Thanks for the confidence, Ellis. Um, I buy this just because I want Wonder Woman to be a great movie. I want it to make a lot of money. I want them to make more of them. I'm very skeptical of this report. It seems like a weird place to have the information slip, even that you are working on a number two when you could when you could show some serious confidence in the property you're about to release and you know release a, an official uh, statement about it. You know, I don't, really, if we want to bring Power Rangers back into the conversation, clearly that didn't work to their advantage, and I think. Announcing yeah, seven it's films. It's one thing to say we're already planning a sequel. It's another thing to say we're going to have seven exactly. Power Ranger movies. And as much as I love it, out. I will admit that was a very silly decision to make. But on the one hand, when you release an official press release from the studio, that to me is a big show of confidence. This is still an unconfirmed quote that came from someone we don't know personally. Who knows what was really said and what context, what, what her intonation was when she said the sentence. I don't know, but... Until, until I get that official press release in my hands, I'm not going to get too invested because I see what happens when I get really hyped about a DCEU movie and then it's pushed back, things are shifted. Who knows what can happen? Yeah, I mean, if these reports were true, then I would welcome this news because I like when studios have some sort of plan going forward. I would much rather have you, you know, map out where this movie's going to go in the next three pictures than be like, oh, we don't think it's going to be good, so let's not even worry. Oh, crap, it did well? We got to start writing a script. Like, I like them having some idea, but I agree with John and Perry where you don't pull Power Rangers and go and announce that you have seven movies. This isn't the Power Rangers universe. And this isn't even the mummy who I think is getting a little ahead of themselves when they're like, hey, guys, we have 19 monster movies we want to tell easy let's see how the mummy does this is a comic book movie this is a big time comic book summer movie we expect sequels to that this is not shocking news to anybody to hear that oh they're thinking about doing a sequel to wonder woman of course they are they should have this mapped out because i think this movie's going to crush i think a lot of people are going to like it i think people are going to want more from wonder woman so this john boils down to like when i go to lunch you know what i'm thinking about dinner I'm thinking about the next meal I have. When I go to bed at night, I'm thinking about the nap I'm going to get the next day. You think about the next time you want to do something fun, as opposed to the one time I went to Kenny Rogers Roasters, and I was like, I'm never coming here again. Come on, Kenny Rogers Roasters. Dude, it was wasn't horrible. That bad. No, it, it was, was pretty horrible. Bad. It's pretty bad. Yeah, they had their run. All right, what's next? THR is reporting that the Crown star Claire Foy is Sony's top choice to play hacker Elizabeth Salander in its adaptation of The Girl in the Spider's Web, a relaunch of The Girl with the Dragon Tattoo franchise that has Don't Breathe Helmer Fetty Alvarez attached to direct. The studio has been on the hunt for a new actress to take on the role, with sources for THR saying the finalists came down to Foy and Felicity Jones. The new film is based on the fourth book in the series, which was written by David Lagerkrantz and released in 2015. No release date has been set at this time. Mark Byer saw Claire Foy as Elizabeth Salander in The Girl in the Spider's Web. I will buy it. It's intriguing to me. It's not the biggest name you could have gotten, and for that news, I welcome it. And when you pair that with Fetty Alvarez, somebody who I'm excited to see whatever he wants to direct in the future, I like this pairing. And this is actually getting me a little more excited about going back to this universe than I thought I would be, because I liked the first movie, but I didn't walk out saying, like, hopefully I will at Wonder Woman, like, oh, I can't wait for a sequel to this. I was like, oh, that was a good standalone movie. I could go for more more pictures in this world if they do it right. So I'm pretty surprised right now that I'm buying it as big as I am. Schnapp? Yeah, I'm going to buy this. I mean, I saw The Girl with the Dragon Tattoo, the original one mm -hmm. in the theater. With Numi Rapace? Yeah, with Numi Rapace. And I loved it. And I, I didn't even realize it was based on a book and there were two more. So it was really exciting to, oh, there's two more of these? So I love the original trilogy. So when Fincher remade the first film, it was kind of a bummer for me because I'd already seen the, first, the original one like several times, and it follows the same story. It very much is a remake, but just for American audiences. So I, I welcome a brand new version, and I, I'm glad that they don't, they're not sticking, they're not touching those other three books. Those have been redone to death. The original, you know, version is the best version to see. I want to see this version. So hopefully they make more of them. I like the character. 
I'm one of the rare people that I actually preferred Fincher's 2011 mm. remake. Uh, and, I, and I do really like the original one from 2009 as well. I just thought there was something really special. I loved the chemistry between Daniel Craig and Rooney Mara, who I thought gave a hell of a performance in that. And I have really been waiting for them to do a sequel. Mm. I've wanted, I wanted Fincher back, and, New, and not Numi Rapace, I'm sorry, Rooney Mara back, right. and Daniel Craig back. I wanted to see these people come back and continue what they started. Clearly, that all fell apart. So, that out of the way, understanding I'm disappointed about that, I buy this. Mm -hmm. You got to, Fede Alvarez is on a roll right now. The dude has just proved you can give him any elements and he'll make a great story Wait, out of it. He's going to direct this? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Wow, so how did I miss that? I, I don't know because can I actually read it? Yeah. <laughs> Quadruple no buy it now. Yeah, I'm like even more exciting. You yes. know, when, when somebody gets up there in years, um, <laughs> you don't necessarily oh, hear oh, everything. I, wait a sec, <laughs> just repeat what you said. You want I, some tea? I can't see right now either. Like, Careful, it's almost his bedtime. All right, oh. uh, I, I buy this. This is, to me. and then you add the girl from The Crown, which is like the hottest show on yeah. TV right now. Uh, of course, yeah, I'm disappointed they're not continuing with the with the last round of cast and director they had. But if that's not the case, this is as good as anything, so I buy it. I buy it as well. And, you know, I haven't seen Wolf Hall or The Crown, but she got a, a SAG and a Golden Globe Award for uh, The Crown, so I know she must be talented. I think I've seen her in, like, small supporting roles here and there, but nothing that says to me she's going to be perfect for this part. But I was never particularly attached to the Fincher remake of uh, Girl with the Dragon Tattoo, so... It's not like I'm so attached to that that I can't move on to a different story with different people in those roles. But even then, because I wasn't so attached to that, I feel like I kind of don't care to get more of these at this point. I am perfectly fine with the originals. And the only reason that I am so high on this movie now is freaking Fede Alvarez. Mm. I, yeah. He is just so, so talented between the Evil Dead remake, Don't Breathe, I cannot wait to see what he does in this world. And it, this is the kind of thing that I think is going to force him to adapt the style he has established so well in those two movies. So I'm really excited to see him grow as a director more so than anything. All right, what's next? Universal Pictures has unveiled a new behind-the-scenes featurette for The Mummy, and it gives us a better look at Russell Crowe's Dr. Jekyll Ooh. character while also giving his other, more sinister side with Mr. Hyde. The film marks the beginning of an interconnected universe of Universal Monsters movies, with the major connective tissue from The Mummy and other future films being Crowe's Dr. Jekyll character. Directed by Alex Kurtzman and starring Tom Cruise, Crow, and Sofia Boutella as The Mummy, the movie is set to hit theaters on June 9th. John, buy or sell the new featurette for The Mummy. Buy. Really buy. Again, this is, a, this is, I love these scenarios where you hear about some stuff, you hear about a new film or new franchise, and you're skeptical about it, and you don't like it, and then you start to see things, and it turns your mind around. That's what the mummy marketing has done for me, and this little behind-the-scenes thing is great, and they're already laying the groundwork with S.H.I.E.L.D. Sorry, uh, Prodigious? <laughs> Prodigium. Prodigy? Prodigium. 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 With Prodigium <laughs> kind of being the hub, if you will, of what's going to happen in this Universal Monsters universe. It feels... But it feels right to me. It doesn't feel like they're getting ahead of themselves. It feels like they're just setting the stage for what can come later. Hopefully the movie doesn't set that stage at the expense of what's supposed to happen in this movie. Mm -hmm. We'll see what that happens. But I really like what I've been seeing. Now, I, Russell Crowe, my, I think the number two best actor in the world right now. He looks great. I do hope Hyde looks a little more different than just weird color eyes and a couple of veins popping out of his head. I want to see Hyde look a little bit more different than that. Doesn't necessarily have to be the same Hyde we got in the League of Extraordinary Gentlemen, per se, but I'd like to see a little <laughs> bit more of a transformation. But I'm really digging what I'm seeing from this so far. Perry, what about you? Yeah, I'm buying this as well. I'm really excited about that. I've really been enjoying the, uh, what, do, what do they call it? Monday Mummy? M Mummy Mondays. Mummy Mondays. I reversed it. <laughs> that um, I think it was a uh, sci-fi that's doing it, and they did one with Sofia Batella's character last and that to me seems like the perfect way to kind of lay the groundwork and pave the way to the actual movie because these are new renditions of the characters and everyone's like well what do we expect what does this mummy movie mean for the rest of the franchise and you know it's like we got her mummy in that first one and now we're getting this which shows a little bit of what we're getting in the mummy but also paves the way to those future movies I'm just getting so excited but the more and more good promotional material I see from the mummy the more I get nervous if it's going to suck. And I'm not saying that there's anything in these pieces that make me think, oh, this is going to be a god-awful movie or anything like that. It's just one of those situations, like with Power Rangers, like with the DCEU, where there's so many things that they've said that I could have those things, 
but it relies on this movie being really great and making a lot right. of money. So I'm seeing all these cool things, and I'm like, please, just let me ha- let this be good so I can have the rest of them, too. Schnapp. Well, I'm not getting any Van Helsing vibes from any of the trailers. True. Yeah. I mean, I remember, like, you could smell that out. You're like, oh, this this doesn't look right. You know, there's certain things, that, even in the trailers, you're like, ah, that looks like a weird rushed CGI job. Or even from that twice-baked Dracula film, what was it, Untold Dracula? Untold. Ugh. Dracula Untold. A bunch of the v- vampires forming a fist. Get out of here. Anyways, <laughs> bothersome. Um, but nothing in this, tra- nothing in any of these trailers that I've seen from The Mummy have has affected me like that. I've got to say, Russell Crowe as Jekyll and then... To see the even the slight transformation, even if it's just eyes, like one of my favorite Jekyll and Hyde uh, stories ever done was the six episode BBC series simply called Jekyll, which is fantastic. And when the character transformed into Hyde, his hair just got a little weirder, but it was all in the acting, <laughs> right. which is what is the most amazing thing about hiring someone like Russell Crowe is he is one of the world's greatest actors. So I don't need to see him covered in hair and makeup and like, oh, I just want him to be... <laughs> pure evil personified as Hyde. And we maybe we'll see a bunch of weird hairy hand under that black glove. But yeah, everything about this feature, Ed, I'm really excited about the prodigium. I want to live there. I want to become one of the <laughs> scientists like investigating weird stuff. It sounds cool to me. I'll, I'll buy it, but you're, you're, putting, you're putting carts really close to horses here. If you're not putting them in front, they're like side by side. Like, let's just, let's, let's go see the mummy. Okay, let's go see the mummy. And I would also caution people who aren't don't want too many spoilers for what's going to happen in the mummy especially towards the latter half mm-hmm. of the movie from watching this stuff because they're putting out a lot of promo to this is a Dr. Jekyll Mr. Hyde th- it's I know it's attached to the mummy but let's go see the mummy and see if that is good more so than any other film coming out this summer I am dying to know what the studio's number is as far as an opening weekend success for this movie mm. because it seems like they're setting a really high bar for this like if this thing makes 60 million dollars opening weekend is that going to be is that good enough because there's a lot riding on this movie all of a sudden, and it does make me a little nervous. Now, this actual clip I thought was pretty cool. So I'm going to be the personal trainer that's like mainlining Death by Chocolate into his toes when nobody's <laughs> looking. Like, I don't want to be this hypocritical, but I enjoyed this. I just like, let's, let's all take a breath and make sure the mummy's good. All right, guys. Well, listen, uh, we are heading into the last part of the show, in which we like to save a little bit of time for you guys for Twitter questions. Now, we got a few other things to do for you first, but you can start sending in Twitter questions now if you're watching us live. Just make sure you're following us on Twitter at Collider Video and start tweeting those in, and Wendy will pick a couple out. I also want to remind you that Movie Talk is not the only show on Collider Video today. John Schnapp and his crew on Heroes, a brand new episode live <laughs> at 1 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. That's 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. You're going to want to check that out. Of course, yesterday, a brand new episode of TV Talk went up. As we mentioned, there's an Alien Covenant review up that you can check out. A brand new Schmodown tomorrow with Team Double Toasted versus The Real Rejects. You're going to want to check that out as well. So now, before we get to your Twitter questions, we'd like to save a little bit of time for Mailbag. If you got a topic or question you'd like us to address on the show, just email us anytime at collidervideo at gmail.com. Ashley, what's in the mailbag today? Jesse writes, hey, Collider crew, big fan from Australia. I have been watching you guys for many years and love everything you do. I just wanted to know what you guys thought about Dwayne The Rock Johnson throwing Army Hammer's name out as someone he wants to play Shazam in a recent interview. Army has been rumored to be playing a character in the DCEU for a while now, and we still have no confirmation. Could he be playing Shazam? It's possible. I mean, it's very possible. We know there's a lot of people in there. Like, I, I'm a big fan of Army Hammer. Mm-hmm. Like, the Lone Ranger notwithstanding. Um, I'm a big fan of Army. I love what he did in Social Network. I, I really liked him a lot in Man From U.N.C.L.E. Um, so I, I think he's a really, he's phys- physically, he's the guy. I mean, he's a giant of a man. Right. He's just a huge dude. So physically, he can bring it. I think he's got the acting chops to do it. But, you know, The Rock, The Rock is doing what The Rock does. And what he does so well, and you know, he he talks a lot and mm-hmm. shares a lot on social media. Like he also said, he wants Patty Jenkins to direct. What was he saying? He wants Patty Jenkins. The Jungle to, Cruise movie. Yeah, he wants Patty Jenkins to direct the Jungle Cruise. He wants this. He wants this. He wants this. And that's cool. It's not necessarily authoritative. I do think we're going to see Army Hammer in there. Um, I still kind of think he's probably going to end up being the new Nightwing, aka the new Batman, mm-hmm. at some point. But maybe it'll be Shazam. That wouldn't be a bad thing. I still was kind of holding on to the hope that maybe. They were going to play that. Rock played both Shazam and Black Adam. That since the core, their power comes from the same place, that in their transformative modes they would mirror each other. Maybe they're not going in that direction at all. But if it does end up being Army, I'm totally good with that. Yeah, sure. Army Hammer's a guy who like like the Lone Ranger is something where I like like you need to make like three good movies to make me 
not want to, to make me want to see him again. Right. And he's he's on the way back. So, but I don't <laughs> pin the one Ranger on. It's just it, it's a long time to get that bad taste out of your mouth. He was great in Social Network. He was great in Man from Uncle. So I'll be up for seeing him some sort of superhero sometime soon. I think the world needs to re-embrace Army Hammer. He was just on such a high, high after Social Network, and then he just got a string of movies that I don't think were at his level, and it's unfortunate, and those things are ones that are not going to go away, like The Lone Ranger. He is so freaking talented, though, because I loved Man from Uncle 2, and I just loved him in Free Fire also. He deserves big things. I don't necessarily know if this is the perfect role for him, just because, like what I said before, I'm still trying to get my, my bearings with the DCEU, <laughs> and I want him, I really want him whatever his next big project is going to be, to be a, a sure thing or a likely thing. So I'm a little nervous to say, throw him in here. But I want good things for Army Hammer, no matter what they are. I got to say, I've recently seen the pictures of him as Batman from Just League Mortal, with, like the finished outfits. He cut a badass look as Batman. I feel like After seeing that, I was like, he could have done not just Bruce Wayne, but Batman really well. Oh. I see him fitting into the DCEU flawlessly whether they cast him as green lantern whether they cast him as nightwing whether they cast him as billy batson or shazam or whoever else he's gonna be he's kind of born to play one of these characters he's six five good looking you know still can jump around flexible he's not gonna get hurt and like ah, oh, my leg you know or anything it's like you know he's got another 10 years that's why the rock is like look get him in at shazam i'm sure zach efron is like yo yo what's up you know, i know i know i just have to say that it's all part of the game it's a shell game that the rock likes to play and i'm playing it with him i'm like yo get army in there all right now before we get to our twitter questions we announced a little bit earlier on the show that today is a special day and it's also schnepp's birthday uh, and uh, we got a little something yeah! for schnepp over here there oh my is. goodness hey look at that Thank you, thank you, my Collider family. You guys are all awesome. Happy birthday, buddy! Now, now, somebody take the cake away from him. We'll eat that later. <laughs> yeah, Schnepp, yeah. I think other than... Uh, let me look around the room really quick. I think other than Dennis and me, like you've kind of been with us the longest. Yes, I... I it was uh, August 2012 when uh, I about, came on uh, Guardians of the Galaxy. Talking about Guardians of the Galaxy. Uh, and everyone was like, get that comic nerd. He was just on the, the whatever Morgan <laughs> Spurlock's thing. He reads comics and he can talk on camera. <laughs> so I came on. I had a blast. I was like, dude, I could do this. I remember you were like, hey, man, that was really fun. Do it again. Come back whenever you want. I was like, dude, I'll come back. And so I just every week just started coming back. It became a regular and thing. here we are, and Guardians of the Galaxy. A whole, That's right. A whole Guardians of the Galaxy sequel later. Yeah, really. <laughs> we're still here. All right, guys. Guys, I said we'd save a little bit of time for your Twitter questions. We're going to do that right now. So, Wendy, what have you picked out? The first one comes from Box Office Artist, who writes, Slash Film is reporting Justice League is undergoing major, major reshoots. What are your thoughts? Okay, first of all, um, Slash Film is not... If I understand this right, Slash Film is not reporting it. They are simply letting you know that there is somebody else reporting mm -hmm. it, and it is a not necessarily a reputable thing. Right. So just keep that in mind. But duh, we've been telling, we've been saying forever, every major blockbuster movie plans and schedules and budgets for going back in for reshoots. They all do it. And I feel like every single big blockbuster movie comes out now. It's, did you hear they're going for reshoots? Should we be worried? No, this is part of the plan. Look, I'm not saying Justice League isn't a mess. Maybe it is. Maybe it'll be terrible. I don't know. But don't let the fact that we hear that they're going in for reshoots bother you because they planned to go in for reshoots. They budgeted for reshoots. They scheduled for reshoots. Why? Because when you're a movie that that's big and you have that kind of a budget, the studios know you want to sit down, watch what you're putting together, and you will always come up with new and maybe better ideas. And when you're a big blockbuster, you can have the luxury of the time and the money to plan to go back and tinker with the things you want to tinker with. So, don't worry about it, really. I mean, the Justice League is either going to be terrible or it's going to be amazing, and it'll have nothing to do either way with the reshoot. Snap. 
Yeah, let's use Rogue One as a great example. Everyone was crying about like 40% of the movie's been reshot. It's going to be horrible. And that scene of her running in the dead, you know, that's not in the movie. It's like, I loved Rogue One. Everything they did, they plussed it. I like using that terminology. It's not just pickups. They're plussing the scenes. Marvel always saves a little pocket of time. They're like, look, we're going to come back and shoot some new stuff. We're going to probably take some scenes that didn't work and throw them away. They become deleted scenes or maybe you never see them. It's nothing to worry about. It's, it's really trying to make the best two-hour product or under two-hour product that they can make a story that will be enjoyable from beginning to end and exciting and something that you want to see on the big screen. So I think, you know, them doing reshoots for Justice League, whether they've done three, whether they've done five weeks, whether they've done six months of reshoots, it's all to make the final end product that we're going to see in November as good as it can be. So I, I don't think you should be worried about it. All you should really care about is when you see the movie, is it as good as it can be? So that's really the final. The litmus test is like, was it a good movie? Perry. That's what it comes down to, what the final movie is. But still, with this particular report, don't read into it too much because I don't believe this source has the greatest track record. It's not coming from someone that any of us really know or could bet. And also, it reads like a total misunderstanding of how yeah. this whole operation works because... You know, you're talking about remaking a movie, reshooting a movie, like redoing a movie in a way. Like, that's what happens in the editing process. You take your footage, you edit it one way, you decide to make certain changes, you go out and you do reshoots for the, for the bits that are missing, and then that's your, your second version of the movie. And then there's also the issue of having even more reshoots when Henry Cavill is working on Mission Impossible 6, when Gal Gadot is pregnant. There's just a whole lot of things that are not quite aligning here, so... I think this is just a slightly confused interpretation of what's really happening and not a red flag by any means. I think like DC, they, they should just change the term reshoots to just be like the headline should be DC is making the movie better. <gasps> they're, that's all they're doing. Like, like nobody ever does reshoots and they're like, ah, you know what guys, we really like this movie. Let's go make it worse. Let's go shoot some more stuff that doesn't need to be in there. Doesn't happen. Now they may be changing it dramatically. We don't know that. As long as the movie is good when it comes out, I don't, you could be shooting the day before. You could be shooting the Wednesday before the Thursday night release. And if it's in the theater in time for me to enjoy it, I don't care. Look, and, and keep this in mind too. This all, the reason we get triggered a little bit about when we hear Rish is on that much, because we're coming out of an, an era of, for the longest time, for a hundred years, that a movie had a budget and it had a schedule and good or bad, they had to come in on schedule and come in and try to come in and on budget. And if they realized the movie was bad in the editing, oh well, just launch it in January, hide it in the marketing, whatever, because they didn't have any other option. And then in that era, when you did hear about movie going back for reshoots, that must have meant there was something terribly wrong for then a studio who didn't budget for that, blah, blah, blah. But it's a different era now. We live in an era where Kevin Feige says, we just like to review the movie first and then go back and, and then pick it up because you can only really tell what you can improve once you actually see it on screen. And that's what the big budget blockbusters do now. It's a different era. So I honestly, I, I wouldn't worry about it at all. All right, what's next? This one comes from A. Clay, who writes, Is Baby Driver in danger of bombing? I fear it will suffer the same fate as the Nice Guys and Scott Pilgrim versus the world. Well, it all depends. I mean, I'd have to look up. Uh, look, any movie can bomb. Any movie can. I mean, it's not a superhero movie. They're not saving the world. It's about a kid driving a getaway car. Could it bomb? Sure. But bomb becomes a subjective term in relative to how much money do they cost do they spend making the film. In the case of Baby Driver, they didn't spend a lot. Making it like King Arthur, which makes fifteen million dollars opening weekend, and costs you know one hundred seventy-five million dollars to produce. That's not counting marketing and dis distribution, all that kind of stuff. That's a bomb. Whereas like another movie like Badu Bali Two can make thirty million dollars opening weekend. And we consider it an absolute smash mm -hmm. because it's all it's all relative and stuff like that. I don't know, Perry. How do you address that? Um, it's also the issue of you know it's it's an Edgar Wright movie, and I don't mean that in a in a bad way, but. Baby Driver, I think, is in a good position to be the biggest opening of all of Edgar Wright's movies. But that is going to mean something like a $15 million opening, which on summer standards, that might not say smash hit, but it certainly is a step up for him. And, you know, with Baby Driver, it's not going to compete with things like 
summer movies like Transformers and Spider-Man. But if that movie comes out and the buzz continues to be as high as it is, I mean, I think that has 100% on Rotten Tomatoes. Everybody who I spoke to who saw it at South By adores this movie. That's the kind of thing that could open 15 million and then just go the distance. And that's what I'm hoping for. I think something like The Nice Guys is a good comparison because people, I don't think The Nice Guys, like, it, it wasn't like a bomb. Like, it didn't, like, lose a crap ton of money for the studio. It might have lost some money, but as far as a bomb goes, I think you're thinking more like the, the how good the movie was versus how many people ended up seeing it. So I don't think Baby Driver is going to lose money at all. Now, it may be one of those situations where the movie's great and just not enough people get their eyeballs on it, but those movies tend to stand the test of time, whether it's in theaters or on whether it's streaming afterwards or whatever. But I think Baby Driver is going to be just fine if it's as good as the trailers look, which right now they look awesome. I cannot wait to see this movie. Uh, do, do we know how many theaters it's opening in? No, it's probably going to be about 2,000. I, I want to say it's like maybe 2,800. Wow. So, I mean, that's going to have a giant opening. Yeah. What's it coming out against? I believe Despicable Me 3, which it's is a Despicable different Me audience. Despicable Me 3 so and, uh, and uh, house, whatever, The House or whatever, the Will Ferrell, uh, Amy Poehler movie. Oh, The movie. House and Amityville, yeah. which so, but, but doesn't that, matter. Like, house, that's yeah. also a comedy, and that's got two big comedy stars in it who are bigger names than anybody in Baby Driver. So you're going with a story, you're going with an underdog versus Will Ferrell and Amy Poehler. So I, I think that that could take money away from it, but that might just be one of those weekends that we talk about a lot on Monday where you look at the box office and it's like everything did at least $15 million. You had a right. couple of movies do 15 to 20. You had a couple do 20 to 25. You had one bigger one, which is going to be Despicable Me 3. So hopefully it's just one of those weekends when everybody goes to the movie. Yeah, it sounds like it's a counter-programming weekend. And it's like, I guess if, if uh, Baby Driver keeps the word of mouth going... I think it'll be a smash hit. It so. also is getting a little bit of a leg up on the competition by coming out in theaters on a Wednesday. That's mm. where that's how it's listed here, and the release still says wide. So mm. I, I don't know how many theaters it's coming out. That's going to be one of those films, like because Edgar Wright's films are always talked about, and they're witty, and they have really good scenes. And it. it's one of those things that everyone who sees it is going to be like, "Did you see Baby Driver?" People are not going to say that with Despicable Me 3. Even if it's fun, it's like, oh, that's a family film. I don't think they're going to say that with any of the other opening films that weekend. Baby Driver is going to be the film that everyone is talking about. All right, guys. Well, that'll do it for this installment of Movie Talk. Thank you so much for joining us. I want to thank the people sitting at the table with me. Starting with the birthday guy himself, Mr. John Schnepp. Schnepp, where can people find you? Hey, you can find me uh, slowly devolving into a child in the year 2400. <laughs> um, but right now, you can find me just on uh, YouTube uh, at Schnepp Zone. You can find me on Twitter and Instagram at John Schnepp for another 50. Right beside me, Perry Nemiroff. I am on Twitter and Instagram at P. Nemiroff. And of course, glider behind the scenes and bloopers every Saturday. This week's episode involves eggs. No, right over here, Mr. Mark Ellis. You can find me making Schnepp happy by screaming in joy, watching Alien Covenant this Thursday night of the movies. You can find me on Twitter at Mark Ellis Live. Over there, we got Ashley Mova. Twitter, Instagram, and I started a YouTube channel, so you guys have to check that out. What? Ashley Mova. Happy Tuesday, guys. And Wendy Lee. On YouTube at the Movie Couple channel and at Wendy Lee Zaney on Twitter, Instagram, and Snapchat. And you guys can simply follow me on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube just at John Campia. That'll do it for us, guys. Thank you so much for joining us, and until next time, bye bye. Hey guys, if you like this video, click the thumbs up button. Also, make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel. It'll help you stay up to date with everything we've got going on here at Collider.